he took on the mainstream media as disgusting people, mainly because they are disgusting people. That was Mark Latham on the day of the US presidential election, commenting on Trump's success in taking on the disgusting people of the mainstream media. Well, Cassie J, director of the award-winning documentary film The Red Pill, has come face-to-face with the disgusting people of the Australian mainstream media in recent days. And we shouldn't forget that The Red Pill, right here in Australia, has been the subject of repeated attempts, some successful, to get screenings of the film shut down since October last year. So there are plenty of videos out there floating around about the interview Cassie had with the project, but you may not have seen the full segment. The Red Pill is a documentary on the men's rights movement. Its creator says that she was a feminist, but was so convinced by how hard men's lives are these days that she isn't anymore. Now, this is why a lot of people don't like Waleed Ali, because he's a smug, condescending asshole. Not even 10 seconds in, and he's already trivialising the idea that some men may face social or economic disadvantage. Her name is Cassie J, and she's made a lot of people very, very angry. Well, that's not quite right, is it? She's made a lot of feminist fright bats angry. Recall the petition that got the Red Pill screening shut down in Melbourne back in October that was signed by 2,355 people. The counter-petition to stop the censorship of that screening garnered more than three times that amount, 8,889 signatures. More recently, a petition with just 42 signatures got the Dendi Cinema to cancel a screening of the movie. The counter-petition to reinstate the screening rallied 868 signatures. The film has received many accolades, including more recently winning a Women in Film Award at Digifest, the first time the Red Pill has been openly accepted and publicly recognised by a woman's organisation. It is currently the second top-selling movie on YouTube in Australia and the top-selling documentary on Google Play. By any metric, there is far more support for this film than there is opposition. It's just that the opposition is a loud, shrill minority that echo the talking points of elitist feminists. Now, the segment goes on to show selected pieces of the film with some cleverly edited, misleading commentary over the top of it. It's the documentary many Australians want banned. No, we've been over this. Not many Australians. In fact, many Australians are enjoying the film. It's a small number of fright bat feminists that want to shut it down. Paul Ellum is widely labelled as a rape apologist. Widely labelled a rape apologist. By whom? The same people that want to stop others making up their own mind whether they want to see the film? Fright bat feminists, perhaps? And he becomes a central voice of the documentary. Now, it's hard to imagine that they've watched the film. Paul Elam is not a central voice. He's one of many people interviewed. There's only one central voice in this film, and that is the voice of Cassie J. She doesn't challenge any of Paul Elam's statements. She doesn't contextualise the things that he says. She doesn't actually do the research into who these guys are and why people have such a problem with them. Well, that's interesting because I don't think the project has done research into who Van Batam is, or probably more accurately, they don't really want you to know who Van Batam is because she's not just a columnist, she's a feminist and an avowed communist. And like most communists obsessed with social engineering and control, it's her duty, dear comrade, to tell us how Cassie J should have conducted her documentary. Now, if you've ever listened to Cassie J talk about the red pill, she did challenge their ideas. What she does in the documentary is present both sides and lets you, the audience, make up your own mind. And in fact, she does contextualise Paul Elan's statement, something that feminists often neglect to do. I then discovered that Paul Elam's famous Bash of Violent Bitch article was written in response to this article by Jezebel called, Have You Ever Beat Up a Boyfriend? Because, uh, we have. It's hard for me to imagine that Van Battam's actually watched this film, given her statement. In keeping with her communist roots, Van Battam wants to tell you what you should think of the film, rather than let you decide for yourself. Cassie goes on to interview 11 more MRAs and their supporters. Yeah, and she interviewed a total of 45 people, including a number of prominent feminists. But that doesn't fit with the narrative, does it? 
In Australia, one woman dies each week at the hands of a partner or former partner. One in three experiences physical violence from 15 years of age. One in five experiences sexual violence. And women are five times more likely than men to need medical attention as a result of their partner's actions. Women also earn on average $17,000 a year less than men and retire with half the amount of super. Cassie, you've got to do some research, mate. It is really hard to be a woman and you can be talented and you can even be rich and you can have many, many privileges and yet you can still find yourself in a situation where your gender is the reason why you can't advance or actualise or enjoy equality or feel safe. Well, nothing out of Van Badham's mouth suggests that she's done any research either. Women can't feel safe. Well, imagine what it's like to be male. Yes, one in three women will experience violence in their lifetime, and so will one in two men. In many ways, the cherry pick statistics shown here is the perfect example of what the film is designed to address, the one-sided nature of the discussion. We're almost always only ever presented with the statistics that affect women. This film is about giving a voice to the issues that affect men, and that shouldn't and doesn't detract from issues that women face. Funded by a Kickstarter campaign, the film raised more than 211,000 US dollars. But many of the film's backers are MRAs, and Netflix and many Aussie cinemas have reportedly refused to show it because of the backlash. And wasn't that an artful piece of editing, giving the impression that the film was funded by MRAs? Let's hear Cassie J on how the film was actually funded. My interview with them was at least 15 minutes long and less than five minutes made it to airing. Uh, So some of the questions and answers that they cut out, deliberately cut out of my interview was they asked me how the film was funded. Was it funded by MRAs? And I explained very well how the film was funded and they chose to take that out of the the aired episode and they also included in their little video intro to my segment saying that it was funded by MRAs with uh, over 2,000 person figure next to the word MRA suggesting that over 2,000 MRAs funded my film which is entirely untrue and misleading and I, I dispelled that myth uh, because it wasn't funded by MRAs, it was funded by three self-identifying feminists, myself, my mother who's my producer and my camera person, my fiance, and, uh, and then I turned to Kickstarter to fund the post-production of the film so that I could keep complete creative control over the project and feminists, as well as MRAs and people in the middle, funded the Kickstarter campaign. So all across the board, and none of them had any influence or say over the final product. So the film that is the Red Pill movie was entirely my own creation and choice, and I wasn't um, you know, influenced by any kind of uh, organization or outside funding to make a propaganda piece or anything that the project is trying to suggest. So with that as a setup, then we go into the very heavily edited interview portion. Cassie's in Australia to promote her documentary and she joins us now. Cathy, thanks very much for joining us on the show. I, I think it's fair to say it's been something of a hostile reception to the documentary in Australia. Has it been uniquely so? It has been uniquely so. In, in the rest of the world, we've actually had great reception to the film. Uh, just two weeks ago, I won the Women in Film Award in Los Angeles. Uh, which the Women in Film Organization is trying to get more female filmmakers and writers and producers behind the camera. We've had a lot of success in other countries, so Australia is really the only place that we've had protests and petitions and bannings like this. Do you have an understanding as to why those protests are there? I do not. Uh, This is my first time visiting Australia. I'm curious what is different about Australia that makes this topic so polarizing and, and so fearful to people that they actually want to shut it down and silence it and pull it from theatres. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why, why there's so much resistance in Australia. Cassie, I think it could be to do with the fact that a couple of years ago our Australian of the Year was a mum who lost her only son at the hands of his father in a domestic violence incident. One woman is killed every week at the hands of domestic violence. It's, it's really on the agenda here in Australia. It's not tolerated and we're really trying to move forward and, and get it on a path where women aren't dying. I think that is why your film has hit a nerve. What an utterly vacuous statement, firstly for using a single anecdote, but do you not think it's on the agenda in other countries? The point of the red pill is not to say that violence against women shouldn't be on the agenda, but how about including men? 
the film does not seek to minimise domestic violence, just that it's not a gendered issue. And it was her son that passed? It was her son who was killed by his father. That's, I, I didn't know about that, but that is interesting because it, it shows that there are male victims of domestic violence. Sorry, that, that's the lesson you took from that? Because children are always factored into the domestic violence conversation. The, the point that I think a lot of people take from that is that the violence was perpetrated by a man in that situation, as it overwhelmingly is, particularly in cases yeah. where there's a fatality. Nice deflection, Waleed. Yes, women are more likely to be killed or seriously injured in domestic violence, but men are victims too. One man every four weeks is killed by an intimate partner in Australia. But how about this? Two women kill themselves every day in Australia. But I propose our national policy on suicide prevention should focus on male suicide only, because six men a day in Australia kill themselves. So clearly suicide is a gendered issue, and we can't waste a single dollar on females that take their own lives. That, this is a, a very, you know, touchy subject that does, uh, you know, can quickly offend people. So I'll use my words wisely. But it's something that I really thought long and hard about while I was making the red pill. Where I've come today, after four years of working on the red pill, is that we have to distinguish between victims and perpetrators or criminals or the evil people in the world, because uh, you know, a, a boy who is being abused by a parental figure, that is a boy that deserves care and compassion and resources if he needs to find help. And so I'm not sure about the, in Australia, but in the U.S., we only have one domestic violence shelter that accepts male victims and 2,000, over 2,000 for female victims. In the movie, you start by Googling rape culture, but you don't seem to sort of touch on that again. And even when you speak to Paul Ellum, who, you know, claims that, that women want to be raped, and he said many other highly offensive things. You don't seem to ask him about that. Why didn't you ask him about that? I did ask them about that. I have 100 hours of footage, and the film is two hours long, so a lot hit the cutting room floor, and I do plan on releasing all the footage that I gathered. But, of course, I asked all those questions. I spent at least two hours with each person I interviewed, but the longest was eight hours. And a lot of the, the comments, if taken in context, have explanations for why they said those things that that do come off, you know, off-putting or offensive in some ways. And, uh, you know, oftentimes it's either satire or they're trying to make a point that, you know, if the genders reverse were reversed, uh, this wouldn't be acceptable. But Cassie, don't you think viewers deserve to see what some of those answers on rape culture were? What a ridiculous question. Why does Cassie J owe the audience answers about anything? It's her film. She gets final say what goes into it. She just explained she had to condense 100 hours of footage into a two-hour film. Since when is the audience owed anything? Where do you get this sense of entitlement from? You know, I edited the film, and I include a lot of topics in the film that I, I hope when people see the film they want to talk about what is included in the film rather than what was left out because there was a lot included. Uh, but what, the reason I chose to leave out the or not go back to the rape culture discussion is because you really can't put... 10 minutes into this film about rape culture and have it be complete. It is such a deep rabbit hole and I think it deserves its own film entirely. There are valid arguments that you raise, particularly regarding the court rulings and male suicide, but don't you think that you undermine all that by making sweeping arguments about how both genders suffer in a similar way from domestic violence? I mean, aren't generalisations like that dangerous? I, I definitely believe that generalising is dangerous and, and we see that very often with uh, female rights advocates. Uh, I did leave feminism after making this film because I saw feminism as having blinders on that they only focused on women's issues and you know girls' issues. A men's rights activist would say, well, here are all the men's rights issues. And I, as a feminist, would want to say, but what about women? We've got to look at women. And men's rights activists would respond by saying, we do look at women. Can we talk about men here? This is just a conversation where we want to talk about men and boys' problems for just five minutes. All right, Cassie, we're out of time. We'll have to leave it there, but thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, as frustrating as that is to watch, I think you should keep in mind that Cassie's authenticity and willingness to engage in open conversation on these issues means she comes off better in every single exchange, even when it's an ambush situation like this one. And furthermore, I think the more they try to demonise the film and stop it from being screened, just makes more people who are open-minded 
want to see it. Just look at the success the film is having here online in Australia. And I think the ultimate irony of all this is that a woman that discarded the feminist label is actually the only one that could truly call herself a feminist, if by feminist we mean a strong, independent woman. She defied the mainstream to her own detriment. She willingly faces her critics and encourages debate on difficult issues, whilst those that call themselves feminists lie, misrepresent, defame, and try to shut down debate. So whilst the disgusting people of the Australian mainstream media have done their best to denigrate the film, I think they've only succeeded in promoting it. And don't forget, if you'd like to see The Red Pill, it's available on YouTube, Google Play, iTunes, Amazon Prime, Apple TV, Vudu, and Vimeo. See you next time.